Let's turn to Psalms 139 this morning. We're uh, beginning a new series called Flip the Script. And we're going to be talking about the freedom that God brings us through receiving his truth. So this word, so what's really neat when um, we've been talking, the last series was gifts of the spirit. And it's really neat to know that when the spirit of God, when the gifts are used, whether it be a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, even a, um, a scripture that, that is brought forth, just like what was shared this morning, that it always is incongruent, uh, it's always congruent with what God wants to speak and what, what God wants to share. So even the message that he wants to bring freedom is exactly why uh, Pastor and I wanted, wanted to bring this new series, the, the Flip the Script, because we want our church body, we want us to experience the freedom that God has for us. And sometimes there's a script that we've been following in our life that the enemy has gotten control of our lives. And so we live by this script, but God brings a better script, a better word for us to follow. And so that's what we want to um, bring in this next uh, series as we go through um, the freedom that we have in Christ when we receive his truth. And his truth will set us free from the false script that we've been following in our life. So we're turning to uh, Psalms 139. And if you're familiar with that Psalms, we know it talks a lot about the beginnings as we were formed in our mother's womb. But if we're going to look today specifically at Psalms 139 and we're going to verse, go to verse 16. Over the last couple of days, I've had a little bit of a, a, a cold, and so uh, we've been praying and drinking lots of water and trying to take vitamins, so I'm collecting my thoughts today as we uh, go to the Word, but I know the Lord is with me, so I'm going to go ahead. I know we've prayed a few times, but I'm just going to pray that uh, I can deliver the Word this morning that He would have us to share. Father, I thank you that we can gather together this morning as a family of servant missionaries, God, that you uh, desire to be with us and that you're here already. We thank you that we can feel your presence. We thank you that your word has already been brought forth. And today as I speak this morning, I, I ask that I would not speak on my own accord, that, Father, you would give me a sound mind to speak your words this morning. And, Father, that those that are here would receive, Father, what you would have to say. God, I thank you, God, that your words, they bring life. God, they bring change. God, they they're, give us hope, Father, and they give us peace. So, Father, we pray that your word would do that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're in Psalms uh, 139, and we're going to read here verse 16. It says this, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. What I like about this is I, I don't know about you guys, but I like to plan a little bit. I like to have my life a little bit in order. Um, if you get to know me really well, then you know sometimes I do like spontaneity, but I think if I plan well, then I can be spontaneous, right? Uh, so, so in this here, I, I see that God has ordained for us days already. Before we were even born, before we had our first day, there, are, there, there were days that he had ordained for us. He had planned out already for us. So if you, maybe like me, did a little theater, I did a little bit of theater in high school, and even when I was younger, did, uh, did a few different plays, and I remember getting the script of the play. And, and if you're really a um, good actor, then you know how to read the script, and you memorize not only your lines, but you have to read all the other lines too, right? So that you know where you're at in the play, and that maybe if maybe one of the other uh, people in the play, they didn't remember the, the right line, you can like help them and, and, and fill in. And you guys all work together. If you don't know the whole script, then sometimes it's hard to know your part in the play, right? Your character, you get in the character, you learn the different scenes, and okay, this is a serious scene, or this is a, this is a funny scene, um, is this a scene that we want everybody to laugh? And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I got, got to get that, okay, I got to change my mood a little bit so that so that, that happens. Um, I also did a little bit of um, sound while I was doing that, and I, I surprised somebody recently, I told them I, I did also the makeup for some of our uh, high school plays, and people, they looked at me strangely, I said, well, come on, it, you know, beards and things like that. We did a fiddler on the roof, so I was able to do the do the beards for everybody. Um, but in, when you're when you're in when you when you when you're in a play or you're getting ready for any kind of acting, you have to you have to know the script. And so, if we're talking about flipping the script, what we want to first uh, foundation is is that we know the script itself. We know the Word of God because in the Word of God we have this uh, overarching story of God, right? 
if you're in our missional communities, we've been talking about the beginning, um, going through the field guide, and then also going into the, the story of God, and learning from creation all the way to the end, the new hope that we have, there's a grand story, a grand narrative that God has written for us to take part in, that he created us with an identity, and it speaks to who we are and what we do. Then as we go throughout scripture, we see that different people have, have failed to, to live like Christ, and live like God had designed them to. And so God brings what, the redemption, the hope that we have, right, in Jesus. So he brings Jesus to, to live the better story, to live the story that we couldn't live without us, to give us a hope, right? A hope that we can be united with God, that the effects of sin, the, the brokenness that we see around the world can be redeemed and can be made whole. And so this is the, the overarching story, and each one of us have a part in that story. Each one of us have a place that we, that we can be a part of what God is doing to bring restoration to the world. But then there's moments, right, that we notice as we're examining our story, our lives, that maybe there's some brokenness that still exists in our lives. There's still some thoughts that we want to see God's story come into our lives, right? And so here, here we're going to learn. I'm going to put some three, three points here to begin with about knowing the story, if we're going to learn this story of God, there's three things that we've got to do. And as we're going through this sermon series, um, Pastor and I have been listening to a couple other um, great preachers and orators that have been um, also doing this series. So some of these points, I won't say are my original ideas, but I said these are really inspired points, and I want our body to receive these. So um, the first uh, three things that I want to say, if we're going to, if we're going to learn this script, if we're going to know this story of God, there's three things that we've got to do to start off with. And this is, reminds me of those times when I was um, studying for different parts that I did. Was well, one, we've got to read it. So we all have, maybe this morning, we either have a, a, paper, a paper copy, or some of us maybe have an electronic copy that we do. And uh, in, in today's time, we, it's really easy to find a version of the script that's, that, that fits our vernacular, right? Like we got the ESV and the NASB and we got the King James and NIV and they got even the message. You know, we even got the, the word on the street. If you guys haven't heard that one, the word on the street is another kind of message version, uh, a paraphrase of the Bible. But we have available to us the script. And so what is our opportunity here to, to if we're going to know our part in the script, if we're going to know who God says we are and where he wants to redeem our life and change our life, we got to read the script. In Deuteronomy 19, 19, this was the charge that was given to the, the, um, the priests at that time, was that they were to write the script, they were to know the script, they were to rewrite the script in their own handwriting. That's how, that's how intimately, that's how knowledgeable they needed to be of the script, of the scripture. And I said, man, we in the 21st century, when we got all of the technology that we have, all of the different types of scripts that we have available to us, I mean, we should be able to read the script. And even made it easier, some of you guys uh, already have a version app on your, on your phone maybe. I really like version app because it helps you with reading plans. So it'll give you like the New Testament reading plan, it'll give you like here's 30 day reading plan, a 60 day reading plan. If you want to read the Bible in half a year, it has, it has that available. I mean, so there's, there's no lack of resources to help us when uh, we want to read the script so we know it, we can memorize it, get it inside of us. Um, we also can read it. We also know we can study it. We can read it for all of who it is. We can study and get, get deep into it. You know, they have like word studies available too, topic studies. So anyway, there's lots of ways that we can read it. Another way um, that we can get into the script and know the story is to research it, right? Some of us have been through school. Some of us are, are going through school right now, right? We know research is an important thing. We take a, a topic, we take a word, we take a, a subject matter, and we said, man, I want, I want to know this. I want to be a master of this area. And so the same thing with the, the Word of God. We can research it. We can read it. We can research it. The Acts 12, 11 talks about uh, a people that uh, the Berean, that they say anything that Paul told them, so this, this goes to you guys, Everything that I say on Sunday morning or pastor says on Sunday morning, anything you hear us speak to you, be like the Bereans. What do they do? They went, they took everything Paul said and said, we're going to make sure this lines up with the script. Because if it doesn't line up with the script, then we got, we're telling the wrong story, right? We're saying the wrong thing. So we, wanted, we want you also to be that, that way. Say, man, I want to know this. I want to make sure everything is in line with what God is saying, what his story is for our life. So we've got to research it. 
And then uh, last, last point before we go into today's part is to rehearse it. Now there's a, a preacher named Peter Marshall, and he, and he said, he, he says this, what if we were to read the gospel, we'd just pick one gospel, so we know there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? What if we were to pick one of these gospels, and any time Jesus said to go do something, we went and did it. And we didn't go back to read the next thing until we did what he had told us to do. And I said, oh man. You know, there's some things in the scripture talking about caring for the poor. They're talking about um, being meek and being humble, about going and healing people and, and sharing everything that I have. And I'm like, wow, what if I were to wait or we were to wait? We were to do something. And until we saw God do those things that he said we could do, we didn't read anything more. We need to rehearse it. We need to practice it. Right. It says, it says that we should not just be hearers of the word, because if we're just hearers of the word, it says that we deceive ourselves. Right. Well, we've got to be doers of the word. So what if? Man, if we, we're reading this script, well, okay, it's good memorizing it, I'm learning it, I'm researching it, but then the, the, next, the next level then is, okay, now we've got we to gotta act it out, we've got to live this out. So as we, as we walk through this script these next few weeks, is it going to be encouraging words for us to live by, for us to hear? It's going to be part of the story that we're going to, we're going to know, but, it, but it's also going to help us to change how our everyday life looks. Because the script isn't just meant to be read or memorized, it's meant to be acted out, right? It's meant to be lived out, and we each have a part in the grand scheme of what God has. So let's turn this morning to John chapter 10, verse 10. And if we're going to be flipping the script, we're going to be examining ourselves and finding out where are these areas in our life that we see that are not lining up with the script of who God is. So if Psalms 139, it says that God had a plan for us, that he ordained all these uh, days for us. And then we're going to look in John chapter 10 and see that he does have a good plan for us. He does have a good script for us, right? We know we, we serve a good God. And sometimes we say, well, if God is good and this terrible thing is happening in my life, what, what gives? You know, what is it? What is causing my script not to be the way that I see it should be? Good and perfect like he is. So let's turn to John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So I love this verse. Well, okay, I love the second part of this verse. Everybody else? I like the second part. I like the fact that I know when Jesus comes that he's going to give me life and he's going to give me it abundantly. And I like that because I can sew it on a pillow, right? I can put it on a wall. I can put it on my mirror in the morning, right? Good, encouraging word. It's a, when, if you have, sometimes you have those little boxes with scripture verses. This is a great part. The second part is really good to read. Abundant life. I, I'll, I want some of that, right? And I believe... I believe that in Jesus, that our story, the story of our lives can be that abundant life, right? However, the first part of the verse is still true. (laughs) Unfortunately, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, right? And sometimes when we begin to examine our life story, we find there's these areas where the enemy He's come and he's stolen, he's destroyed, he's caused brokenness in my life, right? Sometimes there's a lie that he's spoken to me so many times over and over and over again that that becomes the script that I'm living by. Oh, I'll never be good enough. Oh, if I only try a little bit harder. So this morning we wanted to focus in on one of those lies, one of those things that the enemy tries to get us sidetracked from the overarching story of God in our life, from experiencing these ordained days to experiencing this abundant life. And this one's maybe a, a hard one for us, but I think it's, it would fit to anybody. But this is a lie that sometimes the enemy says. And, and it's really interesting. The enemy right, is a liar, and he says that his, nat- his native tongue, the you guys know this one? In the native tongue, the tongue that he speaks, it isn't English or it isn't like, uh, or any kind of Kenyan language or Nigerian language or, or Chinese language, right? He says his native tongue is to lie. 
So anything, anytime you, if you're thinking, okay, the enemy is speaking to me, the way to identify it is, this is, whatever he says is going to be not true. Again, it requires us to know the script. But if we know the script, then we can identify, oh, that's a lie. That thing that he's speaking to me is not true. So here's a lie that often the enemy will speak to us and has been reinforced by our society and our desire to be independent, our desire to achieve, and our desire to, to do more, right? This is, a, this is a lie that he can speak to us. He says, you can fix it yourself. Yeah. Ouch. And sometimes I get in that, and I believe that. And I said, wow, yeah, I can, I can fix this myself. And sometimes it turns out okay, right? It's a good thing that we're independent. We can learn how to do things, and we can create things and make things, and, and, and you know, right? But then sometimes... That lie creates disaster in my life and Amen. brokenness. Amen. Because I believe I can fix something that really is not meant for me to fix. Whether it be something going on in my personal life, something going on in my neighbor's life, in my family's life, or in my family situation. This lie can be devastating, right? I can do this myself, right? Maybe you, that our parents have learned this as a kid, you know, they, they get to the certain point where you've trained them and you really want them to be independent and do things. And then that, that, that one fatal moment when they begin to say, I can do this myself, I got this. I mean, no, sometimes when you say, I got this, that, that, terrible things follow people that usually say, I got this, right? I got this, no problem. <laughs> Come crash you down something, right? So I don't know what it is that, uh, that is needing fixing around you. But when I say, I can fix this myself, there's usually an it, right? There's usually, maybe it's a financial thing in your life. Maybe it's a, a relationship issue in your life. Maybe there's a struggle that's been going on. Maybe there's a sin issue. Maybe there's addiction. Whatever it is that's going on, you, you, each one of you are thinking in their mind, that it that you think you can fix. The Lord this morning wants to reveal the truth to you. That you don't have to fix it on your own. That he's able to take these things and relieve them from you and bring to you a better story than what's going on today. That's right. There's different moments in the Bible where we find people that said, uh, I can fix this myself. Some of these examples, they didn't turn out very well. Just let you know. First one is in Genesis 16. That God had given Abraham a story, a better story than what, one that he could ever do himself. Abraham and, and Sarah being older in age, God had promised them that there would be a nation, right? And they would, they would have many, they would have multitudes of, um, of children and, their na- and they would be a- and they would be a blessing to nations. And Abraham and Sarah, they they had no children. Sarah herself, she said that she was barren. But God had promised them that they were going to have a child. So Sarah said, "I think I can fix this." Right. And in Genesis chapter sixteen, starting in verse uh, two, we find that Sarah says to Abraham, "Hey." I have this slave woman, this servant, that if God is going to give us child, I can't bear you a child. So here's the plan. Here's what we're going to, I'm going to give you my, uh, my servant, and you can sleep with her and have a child, and everything is going to be fixed. God's plan is now going to be able to come through in my life. Well, I want you to know there's no shortcuts in God's plan. When God gives us instruction, when God gives us a clear plan, right, we must follow his clear plan. So Sarah says, I can fix this. I'll give you my child, my slave, and we're going to have a child, and boom, the plan is done. Well, shortly later, God's promise does come through, and Sarah does conceive a child. And this begins the greatest conflict that still exists today Amen. between Abraham's blessed child right, and Hagar's child. Christians and Muslims today still, there's still conflict, starting with this Hey, I can fix it. I have this one moment saying, you know what? I got an idea. Let's fix this. I know how to do it. The second, uh, another area where we find um, a good man having a uh, plan that he's received from God, but he decides, you know what? I'm going to do something a little different about it. I'm going to change this up a little bit. In 1 Samuel chapter 13. 
You got Saul. He's a, he's a great king. He's, he's king of Israel. And they've been coming and winning in battle. And God gave a command to him. He said that they, they shouldn't go into battle until what happens? Until the, the prophet comes, Samuel, he comes and he blesses and he makes a sacrifice. Once the sacrifice is made, once they've been made right with God, then he said, go and, go and win the battle. And I don't know if this was God ordained or what happened. Maybe Samuel was a little late getting his hair done or what was going on. It doesn't really say. But Samuel was late to the battlefield and Saul was like getting a little impatient. He said he was supposed to come in this many days and he wasn't there. He said, the battle's right here. The Philistines are among us. I've got to do something. You know what? We'll just we'll just make it. We'll just do the we'll just do the sacrifice ourselves. Don't worry. We don't need the the blessing of the prophet there. We, we got this, and they did it. And then then Samuel shows up right afterwards. Doesn't that happen sometimes? Sometimes we, we go and do something in our own way, and then uh, right after that we see the God way like shows up like immediately after. We're like, oh yeah, I remember that. This is exactly what happens again, right? And then at that moment, uh, Samuel confronts Saul and says, hey, there's going to be somebody that's going to come. He's going to overthrow you. One that's going to be after God's own heart. And that was King David, right? I don't know what would have been different. I don't know how, how King Saul's um, story would have ended or if it would have ended any different. But I know at that moment, there was a moment that he said, no, I'm going to do something in my own way. I can fix this. I can do this. Let's do it. And we also see in the New Testament, we went over a, a series in Galatians. In the New Testament, we have false, false teachers would come and they said, you know what? What Jesus did, it wasn't good enough. Actually, you need to be able to fix it yourself. You've got to follow these laws. You've got to obey these commands. Uh, you know, don't put your trust in what Jesus has done. You've got to do a little something extra. It's, it's a different story than what the script has told us that we receive our salvation by faith over and over again. And so we find these people then in the New Testament, they're getting all confused, and Paul has to come and correct them and say, no, listen to the story, listen to the script. Jesus says it's by faith that we receive this, not by your works that you've done. And so we find there's different things that happen, different brokenness that we find in our lives when we begin to believe this lie that we can fix it ourselves. <laughs> I think one area that we see is that we see an increased pride in people. When I believe I can fix it myself, then I become, um, unnece it's unnecessary for me to get the help of anybody else around me. Yes. I remember one of the times for me where this um, lie, I can do it myself, I can fix it myself, I'm okay on myself, uh, begin to creep into my life and maybe become more a, of a, a, a thing that I followed. It was the day, um, I don't know, I didn't even talk to dad about this this week, but the day that I went off to college. So I had, was, we had moved here to Madison and uh, we're passing, dad had started passing the church here and I were going off to Bible college and it was this moment where, you know, I could go and go to college. And dad said, you know, I could, I could drive you down to college. I was going to Springfield, Missouri. It's about a nine hour drive from here. And, and I remember we had, a, we had a, a, a big embrace in the living room. But in that moment, I, you know, I said, no, I, I can do this myself. I can drive nine hours. You know, I'm a college student. I'm good. But it was, it was, that was a beginning sign of a time that I began to say, I can fix things myself. I can do things myself. as a pride that I could go down nine hours and be the big man on campus. But then as, I, as my story began to unfold as I was at college, I began to see that this, I can fix it myself. When I, when I started to get into bigger and bigger issues, I thought, no, well, I, can't, I can't let anybody know the things that are happening in my life. I can't let them know the, the disaster, the brokenness that's happening, that, hey, actually, it's, I'm not okay because I begin to take pride in my abilities and my things that I could do on my own. So this, ultimately, when we believe this lie, we start, it, it starts increasing pride in our life, but then it also begins to minimize legitimate problems. So there's some legitimate things that we're going through yes. that, we, that the enemy wants us to believe that we can fix it ourselves. We don't need the help of anybody. I don't want anybody to know the addiction I'm going through, the sin, the brokenness that I find myself in today. I, I, I can do this. It's not that big a deal. I just need a month longer, and it, it'll all be better. Oh, I, I, just need a little, I just need a little bit longer just to work this out. I, I, I'll just plan better next time, and I can fix this. It's gonna, we begin to minimize 
legitimate problems in our life. And it requires us to look through a lens that projects that need to be fixed in our life with an unrealistic and optimistic worldview. Yes, amen. We have a helper, but the enemy doesn't want us to take that, he doesn't want us to go there, he doesn't want us to get that help, he doesn't want us to lean on the body who he's brought around us, we begin to minimize these problems in our life. And the enemy would love for us to do that because he knows when that happens and we have to deal with it ourselves. And he keeps us down underneath the weight of the issues in our life. When rather God would have us to live an abundant life, have us come to him and to give us all the burdens that, he, that, he, that, he, that we have, that we carry. So one, it causes pride. Secondly, it causes us, when we believe this lie, it causes us to minimize legitimate problems. Third, it causes us to, to have a feeling of guilt. Right? You ever been in, a, in such a mess and you don't know what to do with it, but then you feel bad because you, you made the mess yourself and you're, you're in the middle of a mess and you're like, this is, this is hopeless and helpless and oh my, and I feel guilty because I, I made that step and I took this thing and I did that there and now I'm here yeah. under the weight of my mess. Yeah. And I feel guilty and I feel bad because I know I've let other people down around me, but I can't let them know I, I, I let them down because I got to hold this wall up that I can still do it. We begin to feel guilt and it sets in. And it, it sucks us of hope. It, helps, it sucks us of our joy. It sucks us of our, uh, even that optimistic view that we had beforehand. Now, now we're just trying to fake it. We, we're not even optimistic about things. We're just trying to make it through. I'm in this mess. And it, feel, it feeds this guilt. But, you know, if we were at the first sign of this issue, we're to run to the help that we have. We're to remember the script that we should live by. We're to live by this abundant life. Things would be different. I mean, go, we can go even a step further. When we begin to believe this lie that I can fix it myself, it also, it robs us of intimacy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. You guys always know those people, right, that have the wall up. Everything's okay. I got this. It's good. Why right, we, we aren't able to relate to each other. Because I don't really know what's going on in your life. I don't really know the issues that are happening. I don't know the mess. And you're trying to hide it from me. And I'm trying to hide my stuff from you. And so we're not really able to know each other any deeper than the hello, hi, how are you? Right? Because we can fix it. I I don't want you to come too close because then you really get to know me. We recently had a night at our missional community. And um, we were all in a circle, and we were talking about what kind of group we wanted to have. And we said, you know, we want a group that we can able, we're able to tell anything that's going on in our life. We want to just be able to share it. You know, if we're talking about prayer requests, we, we want to be real with our prayer requests. We don't want to just have the, yeah, I pray that my week goes okay, that I make it through work. You know, we want to have real time. And, and then um, a good friend of ours, he, he asked, he said, do you guys really want that? Like, like, are you sure? Like, because I know I've been a part of other groups and we got like really serious or we got really deep and there and, and, he, and he goes, um, and I got really deep. And then people said like, oh, sorry, we don't go there right now. No, like we want to be a family. If we're going to say we're going to be a family of servant mission, we're going to be connected together. We're going to be united. And we've got to be people that are willing to say, yeah, I got some issues. Because we don't, want to, we don't want to rob ourselves of this intimacy of knowing each other, knowing what we're going through so we can go together. Because we're not in this alone. But this lie that I can fix it myself, it robs us of that opportunity to be intimate. Because we don't really want to share what's going on with each other. We're not willing to go deeper into the significant things in our lives. It robs us of significant relationships that, that God wants us to build with each other. It robs us of, talk about even for a moment, I know not everybody in this room is, is married, but think about a uh, uh, in marriage, if, if a man and a wife aren't able to share what's really going on with each other. Well, what are the real thoughts of my life? I've, I've been there before. I've been there at the point where I didn't want to share, the, uh, share what's really going on with Rachel. Rachel didn't want to really share what's going on. And there was no way for us to really have a relationship with each other because we weren't able to let ourselves be known. But we got to trust Right, this awesome opportunity in the gospel, we learn that we can trust that no matter what we say to God, he's going to still love us. And the same, if we have that same relationship with him, then we have that same relationship with each other. That we can tell each other whatever we want and trust that we're going to be able to love each other past what the dark, what the ugly stuff is. But that lie, I can fix it myself, sometimes robs us of that opportunity 
to be intimate with one another, to know each other. I love the feeling of being known. When I got somebody that knows me, you know, right? Can call me out. You got, maybe you guys got that friend. Man, it, yes. Let's come back to this slide that we can fix it ourselves so that intimacy can grow, that we can really have true relationships. Another area um, that goes along with this robbing us of intimacy, the next area, when we believe this lie, when we live by this script that I can fix it myself, sometimes we live a, f- a life full of hypocrisy. Again, it's the same kind of, it goes hand in hand with the intimacy, but we don't really want people to know who we are. So we put up a, a facade, we put up a, a fake wall whenever we go and be with people, and so people don't really know who we really are. We, they just kind of know this, this fake Andrew that they, they see every once in a while. This, hey, Andrew, you're always happy. This is great. And sometimes it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be a happy day that you're, I'm sad. It's, it's okay to have some emotion. We don't want to be claimed or named people who are full of hypocrisy. We've got to break this lie that we can fix it ourselves because when we do, then we can be truly known. And then we can truly experience grace and acceptance. So we all want to be known. We all want to be accepted. But the hardest thing is we don't actually allow ourselves to be seen so that we can truly be accepted. But we've got to trust that when we show ourselves for who we really are, that we will be accepted. Yeah. It's, an amazing, it's an amazing aspect of the gospel. So what are some truths? We're going to talk about flipping the script. I, I talked a lot about what this happens when we believe this lie, kind of the script that we live by. But what if we accept some truth? How does that change our script? How does that change our life? So we're going to look at two truths here to close. The first truth is found in Hebrews chapter 4. And this is the truth about Jesus that gives me encouragement. It, it, it brings life to me. It brings joy. And I, I mean, I'm encouraged by it. I love hearing truths about Jesus. Every time I hear a truth about Jesus, it's always, it's always good. And I never hear a truth about Jesus. And, and maybe sometimes they say, oh my, like, okay, I need to, maybe need, need to change that. Maybe. But um, most of the time I'm like, oh, it's refreshing. It's a life-giving truth. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and 16. 14 through 16. It, it talks about Jesus as our high priest. And let me tell you, Jesus is a better pastor, a better minister, a better high priest than I could ever be. So I, I hope, my desire is that you would look to him way more than you would look to me or to pastor. But let's read this about Jesus. Starting in verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may find mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We, the truth is, we have a high priest. Now, if we study a little bit about the high priest, we know the high priest was one that interceded. He took the cares of, of the community to God. He was, a, he was the advocate. He was the go-between, right? We have a high priest, and his name is Jesus. That gives me hope. And I have somebody in my darkest thing, in the middle of my midst, when I see my brokenness around me, I have somebody that, that desires to unite me with God. The desires to help me to help me see God to help God know my cares. He, he says it says in the Word that He sits at the right hand of the Father. And what is He doing at the right hand of the Father? He's praying for you and me. And I have somebody on my side that, that knows what I'm going through, and He's like He's praying. He's Andrew, make it through, man. I hope, man, Andrew. I know that you're going through this thing right now. God, I pray. I pray that He would experience peace. I, I pray that He would experience Your grace, Your character in this moment. He's there. He's. I mean, He's battling for me. He's battling for you this morning. Yes. We have a high. That's the kind of high priest that we have. But it's it's more than that. So sometimes, right? We come on Sunday morning and. Whoever's standing behind this little pulpit speaking, sometimes we, we think they're so different than us. I hope you get to know me, and I hope you get to know Pastor, and know that we're not different than you. We're human beings who go through things, 
Just like you've gone through things, we have broken stories in our past. We have maybe some even broken stories now they're going through. And all of it, we're all trying to, we're both trying to go after God and, and get after God what he has for us, right? So we have a high priest here that isn't like this, he's in a robe and he's untouchable. It says this, right? That Jesus, the Son of God, that we should hold firmly to his faith, 15, it describes him in verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize their weakness. So we don't have this distant person. But he's able to empathize. He knows what we're going through. He's been through it, right? We have one that has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. What's amazing about Jesus is he had an opportunity to take a different script. The enemy came to him and said, hey, look at all this land here. Do you want it? Hey, look, at you can throw yourself off and call the angels. They'll, they'll catch you, right? Hey, this stone, turn it into bread. And he, he's been tempted in every way. He had an opportunity to choose a different script, and he said, nope, I'm going to live by God's script. I'm going to live by the script of my father who sent me to do his will. He knows what we're going through. He knows what it feels like when the easy way is to do this. He knows what it's, what it's, what it's like to take this extra, thing, extra step this way. He knows what it's like. And he's praying for us. He's praying for us. So then what is it? So and when we believe this lie, I can fix it myself. We try to obtain these things on our own. But in verse 16, it tells us a different way to go about things. It says, Andrew, don't do that on your own. Actually, what you can do, the better way, the better script, the better story, is to boldly approach the throne of God. To come to God and say, the first moment, man, I, and the lie is coming to me. I want to do this. I want to switch my behavior. I want to, uh, the enemy is trying to convince me to do this. He says, boldly come to God. Because at that moment, when we boldly come to him, we experience his grace and his mercy. We experience the character of God is given to us. Freedom, joy, peace, man, the right direction, wisdom, or the right thing to say, how to do it. Man, it's all found when we come and we run to his throne. Hallelujah. That's right. Gets me excited, right? I like this. Man, it's gonna, I, I, can, I can change the script that I live by. Amen. When I decide, actually, the better thing is not to fix this myself, but to boldly approach the throne of God, to ask for mercy, to ask for him to come and to intervene in my life on my behalf. It's a different script. <laughs> but when we live by this script, we get God instead of ourselves. And I love getting God more than me. I'm really not that good. And maybe you can think about yourself and say, man, I'm really not that good. But God, if I got God in this situation, if I got God in my brokenness, if I got God in this addiction, in this relationship, if I... If I, man, these things would things be turning around for, for good, right? Second thing. So first thing, a better script is that we can go to Jesus. That he's a high priest. He empathizes. He knows what we're going through. He's going to give us grace and mercy. Second thing is James chapter 5, verse 16. And this is hard, right? If we've been living by this lie... I can fix it myself. This next part is maybe the hardest script to turn in our lives. But as we said, we're a family of servant missionaries. We're a body of believers here. And God has given us to each other as gifts. And one of these gifts is found in James chapter 5, verse 16. Yes. Is that when we confess our sins to each other, we can pray. And the prayer that we pray for each other is powerful and effective. I need some powerful and effective prayers in my life. I don't know where you're at this morning, right? Maybe as we talk, talk, started talking about, I can fix this myself, I begin, you begin to realize, yeah, there's some, there's some things I've been trying to carry myself, and it's been a little bit too much. 
It's burdened me. It's caused me to lose hope. It's caused me to lose some joy. Maybe even caused you to lose some sleep. But you know, you didn't determine. I want to fix it myself. Maybe you've lost intimacy. You've lost friendships because, man, you've tried to do it yourself for so long. And that now you don't even know the people that are around you. The people that are around you don't even know you. And you're stuck in this situation. You don't know how to get out of it. James chapter 5, verse 16 says that you can come to one another. You can confess what's going on. And that the prayer is going to be powerful and effective to change that situation. To turn it around. And so I said, you know, what other way to close today than to start acting in a different script? And I need, I need a different script. Because I know so, when I live by pride, when I live on my own, I end up wallowing, I end up messing around in my own mess and brokenness. But God calls me to a better script. Come to me. Come to me. I'll help you. I'll give you all of who I am. I've offered my whole self to you on the cross. I, again, I offer my whole self to you. Amen. And he also gives us brothers and sisters in this room that desire to walk alongside of us. Desire to encourage us to live by the script. Desire, us to, to, desire to pray for us that, that our life would be turned around, that the circumstances, the situation we find ourselves in will be turned around for his good. So this morning, this is exactly what we're going to do. Is we're going to pray together. And so I want to ask us all to, to bow our heads this morning. And I believe, I know, this was, a, this was a series that we prayed about, that we believe God's going to do some flipping up scripts. He's going to bring some hope where there's hopelessness. He's going to bring some wholeness where there's brokenness. He's going to bring some joy when there, where there's no joy. Yes. He's going to bring some peace. He's going to bring some healing into relationships. He's going, to, he's going to do some things in our body through this series. And it's going to start today. I don't know. It's going to start today. This morning as I spoke, maybe you identified in your life that, that the enemy has been speaking that to you. I can fix this myself. Don't tell anybody what's going on. I just want to say again that the enemy is a liar. He comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus comes to give life. And he comes to give it abundance. And when we put our life into his hands, into his script, we begin to see that come out. We begin to see that abundance. So this morning he said to you, he said, 